You know, I think I have an understanding of why sometimes the world doesn't like us evangelical Christians. And I don't think it has anything to do with uh, the claim of hypocrisy among Christians. Cause, and that's a common charge leveled against us. But the reality is that, you know, our hypocrites are, uh, excuse me, our critics are hypocrites too. And, and uh, I think if you look closely at all of us, um, all of us are at some point uh, hypocrites. I don't think it's really that. And I don't think the world not liking us has anything to do with certain members of our clan who are somewhat obnoxious, you know. Um, we certainly have some like that. Uh, that happens too. But I think for every rude and obnoxious Christian, there's many others that are kind and loving. And so the problem is the kind and loving ones sometimes are not quite as loud as the obnoxious ones. But I think the world sometimes doesn't like us evangelical Christians because our message is so restrictive. By restrictive, I don't mean it's only for a few people. Our, our message is for anybody. Our message is for everybody. <clears throat> but the content of what we tell everybody is restrictive. We basically say this, that truth and fulfillment can only be found in one person, Christ. Amen. And people don't like that idea because that, that idea sounds arrogant. It sounds like we're saying, well, I found truth and fulfillment in Jesus. What's wrong with you? And so sometimes people wonder how we evangelical Christians can be so sure that something else or someone else won't work for them, won't provide them truth and fulfillment. I mean, and they'll say things like, well, you know, after all, uh, there's a lot of Muslims in the world that are just as dedicated to Allah as you Christians are to Jesus. And there's a lot of Hindus in the world that are just as certain that they have found truth and fulfillment in life. So how can you Christians be so sure? How can you believe that truth and fulfillment can only be found in Christ? And I think it's a fair question that they ask. And the scripture that we're going to look at today answers that question. Take your Bible, if you would, if you have access to it, and turn to Colossians chapter 2, verses 8 through 15, and if you don't have access to a Bible, there may be one in the back of the pew in front of you, or you can follow along with the scriptures as they appear on the screens behind me. But if you found Colossians chapter 2, verses 8 through 15, I would invite you to stand, please, in honor of the reading of God's Word. The Apostle Paul writes these words, Be careful. That no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deceit based on human tradition, based on the elements of the world rather than Christ. For the entire fullness of God's nature dwells bodily in Christ, and you have been filled by him who is the head over every ruler and authority. You were also circumcised in him with the circumcision not done with hands by putting off the body of flesh in the circumcision of Christ. When you were buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And when you were dead in trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive with him and forgave us all our trespasses. He erased the certificate of debt with its obligations that was against us and opposed to us and has taken it away by nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and disgraced them publicly. He triumphed over them in him. Father, I pray that you would give us understanding of your word in this passage today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. 
Now, the Apostle Paul is taking a little bit of a different approach than I did this morning. The Apostle Paul is not writing to a bunch of non-Christians who maybe have a problem with the uh, Christians of that day, having such a, a message that's exclusive and focusing their lives on Christ. Paul's not trying to convince unbelievers to become believers in this passage, although that might happen if unbelievers were to read it and were to understand it and maybe even listen in to a sermon about it. But Paul is having a conversation with Christians, and he wants to remind us Christians why we should not look for spiritual truth and fulfillment outside of Christ. Back in verse 8, we read again. He says, Be careful that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deceit based on human tradition, based on the elements of the world, rather than Christ. Now, this verse makes one thing real clear. If you are a believer in Christ, there are two options for how you live your life. There is Jesus Christ, and there is everything else. And that is a pretty restrictive idea. But that is exactly what the Lordship of Christ demands. Now, this idea of there being Jesus and everything else, well, that everything else... That includes every man-made religion. That includes every philosophy. That includes every human tradition. Paul basically puts them all in one big single category, not Christ. And the problem with everything in the not Christ category is that their messages are ultimately deceptive. They cannot deliver what they claim. And someone might say, well, I don't think that's necessarily true. It, it seems like a lot of people who, who don't follow Christ have a sense of fulfillment in their life. I mean, they find fulfillment in different ways and different things that have nothing to do with Jesus. And I'll, I'll tell you, if you put it that way, I'll give you that. I'll give you that. I don't think that's incorrect. It's not like Christians are the only happy people in the world. That's not what we're saying here. What I'm saying is that the fulfillment that people find outside of Christ is temporary and it's incomplete. You see, every single human has within them a God-sized hole in their spiritual heart that only Christ can fill. You can put all of the world's possessions, all of the world's uh, philosophies, all the world's religions, all the world's toys into your heart. You can try it all, but you'll never be truly satisfied until you turn to Christ. Now certainly, there are ways in which you can live your life that have nothing to do with Christ that might bring you a measure of fulfillment. But only Christ will fill up your heart to overflowing, not only in this life, but also throughout all eternity. And the rest of this passage tells us why Christ is greater than all of the religions and philosophies and traditions of the world. Look at verses 9 and 10. We read, For the entire fullness of God's nature dwells bodily in Christ, and you have been filled by Him, who is the head over every ruler and every authority. Look at verse 9. It's at the top of the screen. Look at what it essentially says. It says the entire fullness of God's nature dwells bodily in Christ. You know what that means? It means that Christ is full of God. No other philosophy, 
no religious leader and no human con- uh, tradition can rightfully claim that everything that God is is found in them. But that is exactly who Christ is. He is the complete fullness of God in bodily form. He is God in the flesh. God incarnate. And so, Christian, if you start looking elsewhere for truth and fulfillment, you're looking at lesser things. Why would you ever do that? Now, Look at what the rest of this, these two verses say. Not only is Christ full of God, but look at what verse 10 says. It says, you have been filled by him. Christ is full of God, and you are filled with Christ. Christ himself, the only one who is full of God has come to dwell in you, Christian. And so instead of running after every wild idea and every get-rich-quick scheme and every mantra of the week and meditation of the month, instead of listening to the self-proclaimed grand poobahs and the witches and warlocks who claim to have the knowledge of the mysteries of the universe, what you need to do is to stay in touch with Christ in you. You need to sit at his feet daily. Let him teach you. Abide in him and let his word abide in you. You know, sometimes I come across Christians who think, you know, well, I've been a Christian for a long time. I've heard all the Bible stories. I've read all the Bible passages. I'm going to branch out and try new things. Well, be careful. Now, I'm not saying don't learn anything new. Do. Learn new things, but whatever you do, don't neglect Christ in you. Give yourself to the study of God's Word, the Bible. Even if you've read it all the way through, The Lord will show you things you never saw before, such as what I've put on the screen. For many of us in this room, it's the first time we've ever connected verse 9 and verse 10 in this way, that God is full, that Christ, rather, is full of God, and that we are filled with Christ. You see, the Word of God will never grow old. The Spirit of God will never cease teaching you. But you and I, we have to guard our minds and our hearts and let no one take us captive with false and empty philosophies. Now, there's another phrase in verse 10 that merits our attention. The Christ who is full of God, that same Christ who fills us up, he is the head over every ruler and authority. That means that Jesus Christ is in charge. He is the boss. Jesus Christ is Lord. He is Lord over every empty tradition, over every false religion, over every fruitless fruitless philosophy, He is Lord over all the spiritual rulers and authorities that secretly lie behind these false ideas and give them power, power enough to fool countless people, even if we're not careful, the people of God. Jesus Christ is Lord over it all. Jesus Christ is the only one who can provide you salvation, and he is the only one who can provide you the right way to live. He will never fail you. Now, let's see what else Jesus has done for us. In verses 11 and 12, we read, You were also circumcised in him with a circumcision not done with hands, by putting off the body of flesh 
in the circumcision of Christ when you were buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. Now, physical circumcision is a procedure that is done to male Israelites as a sign of Israel's covenant with the Lord. But spiritually, here's what Jesus has done. Spiritually, Christ has cut off from our lives that part of us that causes us to disobey God. This is what Paul typically, typically calls the flesh. Sometimes he calls it the old self, or if you're reading King James, the old man. A lot of people get confused about these things, and so listen carefully and I'll explain it. Here's what it boils down to. If you belong to Christ, your flesh... Your sinful passions and desires has been crucified with Christ. It's already done. It's already been crucified with Christ. It's like physical circumcision, but this is spiritual. Your spiritual flesh has been cut off and discarded. And Paul says the same thing a little bit differently in Galatians 2.20 when he says, I have been crucified with Christ. It's the same idea. Listen to Romans 6. He says it a little bit differently there again. He says, our old self was crucified with him. And so all of these phrases, and there are others such as, we have died to sin. We have been united with Christ in death. We are buried with him by baptism into death. All of these are essentially saying the same thing. In the next chapter of Colossians, we'll come across a different phrase, which essentially means the same thing. When Paul says in Colossians chapter 3, verse 9, he says, You have put off or taken off the old self like it's a piece of clothing. You've taken off the old self with its practices, and you have put on the new self. So here's what you need to know. This death to self, this circumcision of the flesh, this burial with Christ by baptism into death, this putting off of the old self, however you want to phrase it, this has already taken place. Christian, you are already dead to sin. Your sinfulness has already been cut away from you. Which leads us to a very obvious question. Why, then, do I keep getting tempted? Why do I continue to sin from time to time? Is it because I'm not saved? Is that it? No, that's not it. Here's why. Because even though your flesh is dead, its death does not work automatically. For the death of your flesh to be actualized and realized in your life, it must be appropriated by faith. So how do I do that? Two things related to one another. First, you have to recognize that your flesh has been crucified with Christ. You have to accept that. And secondly, You must consider yourself to be dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. You see, here's the deal. Once you believe that you are dead to sin, then you can live like it. But as long as you believe that sin still has power over you, well, then it will. It becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Christ has already cut off the flesh from your spiritual heart. Believe it and live like it. And by the way, no other religious ruler or philosophy or tradition can or has done what Jesus has done for you. I don't see any of them dying on the cross and rising from the grave. Verses 13 and 14. Paul says, And when you were dead in trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, 
He made you alive with him and forgave us all our trespasses. He erased the certificate of debt with its obligations that was against us and opposed to us and has taken it away by nailing it to the cross. Here's what these verses are saying. We, all of us, we were, past tense, we were dead spiritually. Spiritually, we were as dead as Gandhi and Sigmund Freud and Carl Sagan are dead physically. I mean, just dead. All right? But Jesus made us alive. Now, what does that mean in practical terms? What, what does it mean to feel like I'm alive in Jesus now? How, how, how does this manifest itself? If I'm alive in Christ, you know, sometimes I don't feel alive in Christ. I, I, I wake up on the wrong side of the bed. I don't feel good or whatever. I don't. So what does it mean if I'm alive in Christ? How does that manifest itself? Here's what it means. That the life that Jesus has infused in us, it is expressed in terms of forgiveness of your sins and the cancellation of your debt. What does it feel like? Have you ever just done, done something completely wrong? I mean, you just flat out were dead wrong. And the person that you hurt completely forgave you. That's what it feels like. Have you ever been in debt, as the commercial says, up to your eyeballs? And there's no escape. There's no way you can pay off your debt. And some generous benefactor comes along and says, I got it covered. That's what it would feel like. Every sin that we commit or have committed makes our spiritual debt grow larger and larger. And very quickly it becomes something we can never repay. If you are a Jew, you are in debt to God because God has given you the law and yet you've not fulfilled it. If you are a Gentile, you are also in debt to God because God has put a spiritual light within your heart and within all of creation, and you have not followed that spiritual light. In fact, it's this bad, that you and I have a conscience, right? We automatically know what's right and what's wrong. It's so bad that our conscience itself gets twisted. And in our conscience, we sometimes find ourselves justifying our bad actions. And not only do we try to justify our bad actions and, and twist and manipulate our conscience, but then on top of that, we can't even live up to that standard. That's how bad it is. I mean, you've got a lot of debt that you owe God. But here's what Christ did. Christ took the entire bond, the bond of your spiritual debt and condemnation. He took it and he placed it upon himself. And then he crucified it. Christ has discharged your debt by assuming its penalty, which is death. Jesus, <clears throat> Jesus said, <clears throat> excuse me, Jesus said, send me the bill. And then he paid it. What philosophy would do that for you? What other religion, what man-made religion would do that for you? What tradition would do that for you? None. But Christ he did that for you. And then in verse 15, he disarmed the rulers and authorities and disgraced them publicly. He triumphed over them in him. 
You see, here's the big picture. When Jesus Christ came into our world, when he assumed flesh and lived among us like a man, a very important part of his mission was this, to destroy the rule and authority of every spiritual being and power that does not submit itself to God, that does not serve God. In 1 Corinthians 15, this is what it says in verses 24 through 26. It says that Christ will abolish all rule and authority and power, for he must reign until he puts all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be abolished is death. And then, once the kingdom of Christ has abolished all other authorities, that's when Jesus will hand over his kingdom to his Father, as if to say, I did this for you. Now, you and I, we're waiting for that to happen. That has not happened yet. That is still future. But when Christ died on the cross and rose from the grave, That constituted an initial defeat of those powers. Their doom is sealed. All of the so-called gods of this world that mislead people into endless philosophies and religions and traditions, all of them will be destroyed. The demonic forces that know your weaknesses and your temptations, and keep coming back to you in order to keep you weak, they will be destroyed. Satan himself, the father of lies, who has blinded the lost people that you have in your life, that you love, that you want to see with you throughout all eternity, he's blinded them to the truth of the gospel. Satan himself will be destroyed. And finally, our greatest enemy, The enemy that breaks our hearts. The enemy that destroys our lives. The enemy that steals our joy. The one enemy that you and I can never, ever defeat. Death. Jesus has already broken its power. And there's coming a day When Jesus will take death, he'll cast it into the lake of fire, and it will be destroyed forever and ever. Listen, if you're a follower of Christ, there is no reason for you to turn aside from Christ, to follow philosophies and empty deceit based on human tradition. Let today be the day that you settle it in your heart. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, When fears are stilled, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ, I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save. Till on that cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on him was laid. Here, in the death of Christ, I live. There in the ground, his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain. Then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave, He rose again, and as he stands in victory, sin's curse has lost its grip on me, for I am his, and he is mine.
bought with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life. No fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here, in the power of Christ, I'll stand. Let that be your decision today.